some things that I don't think you even knew existed. It goes against everything Manifest Destiny teaches about Native Americans. And I want you to know this part of our history because people erased it, and we'll get to that later on in the program. Erased it intentionally. Erased it intentionally. That's an important part of it. The cover-up of, uh, let alone Native American sites, why would uh, so many people be covering up the evidence of earlier civilizations in the Americas? I think some people have called it a colonial cover-up, a colonial archaeological conspiracy. There's two sides to this story. Uh, in, in one side of the story is the way America was conquered by basically Anglo-Saxons. Uh, and, and in that conquest of the, of the Americas, what they, what they confronted was an indigenous people who had inhabited that realm for tens of thousands of years, we now know. Uh, and the first thing they did was to attempt to exterminate them physically, to get them out of the way. And when that became objectionable, the next measure was to exterminate their culture, to rub it out, to pour scorn upon it, to say that it was of no value. That in a sense, the, the absurd and monstrous argument was that the Native Americans deserved what was done to them because they were supposedly not, uh, not capable of any high culture. We now know that that's, that that's completely untrue. And that was a conspiracy. That was a conspiracy to destroy Native American culture and thus to, to legitimize the conquest and the massive theft of land. And it carried on into the 20th century with the so-called boarding schools where Native American children, almost all of them, were taken away from their families. We've talked about hundreds of miles away and put in schools and, and, and taught that their culture was rubbish and indoctrinated with, 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 with Western We've actually talked about Thankfully, some artifacts in ancient cities yet remain such as these once city walls, intentionally preserved as mounds in a golf course in Newark, Ohio. I'm standing here at the parallel walls that connect the gigantic octagon with a large circle. The circle is 1,054 feet in diameter. The octagon encloses 50 acres, which is large enough to encompass four Roman Colosseums. This was built by the ancient Hopewell culture that lived in this region between about 100 BC and AD 400. The level of precision, uh, it, it is incredible. The entire Newark Earthworks encompasses four and a half square miles, and it was the largest complex of geometric earthworks ever built in the world. It includes two circles, a gigantic octagon, a square, and actually what we call the Hopewell culture, uh, things like it at least and things related to it uh, covered much of eastern North America in different parts as far south as Florida as far east as uh, as far west as Kansas City as far east as perhaps New York they had to be incredibly sophisticated um, to be able to build these mounds perfectly you know in unison to an octagon shape and a circular shape it's clear that they rival by any scale uh, any other cultural achievement in the world, the Great Pyramids, the Great Wall of China, um, the Roman Colosseum. I'm not that surprised by it. Um, there's so many other things that we see when we start learning about and looking into Native culture that I think people on the surface may be surprised because they tend to think of Indian people as anti-intellectual or, you know, non-scientific or somehow you know, living in the backwoods and not knowledgeable about things like that. The knowledge embedded in these earthworks and encoded in their structure is anything but primitive. It's remarkable. You know, it also shows that not just high math, but uh, these sites are lined up primarily with uh, the, lunar, uh, the lunar calendar. They had high math, they understood geometry, and because of the lunar calendar, they also understood the heavens, astronomy. What I've learned now is just how amazing uh, they were in terms of their knowledge of the solar system and of mathematics. And then they had the unit of, of measurement was 606, which they call the stade. One side of the Great Pyramid from the base to the tip of the apex is 606 feet. If you square inside the octagon, which the uh, uh, surveyors like to call, it's a term they use, squaring, squaring the circle, and you divide that up into four equal parts inside of the cubes, you'll find those cubes are all made of 606 foot lines per cube side. The angle of the Great Pyramid of Egypt runs 51.8 degrees uh, up the slope from the base to the, to the angle. That, that measurement is there. And when you come off of the, uh, the baseline at uh, Newark, 
and you run true north and then measure that angle back to the baseline, what do we find? 51.8 degrees. So did they have the same math as the ancient Egyptians? Uh, well, I gotta say, yeah, it sure looks like it. All right, so quickly I wanna read from this uh, newspaper article that I found. Um, it was from the, it says here, the Kansas City Journal uh, from Monday, October the 12th, 1896. And the title is Prehistoric Man, the Human Race and Its Dispersions. How long has the earth been people and when and where was the beginning? All right, so we've been doing a lot of research, right? Correlating a lot of things that, uh, you know, America is the true old world. All right, more and more evidence is just going to keep coming out. We're just going to keep finding all these uh, investigations, studies, articles, uh, documented, recorded, uh, historical uh, chronicles um, and information, right, that existed that never was taught to us, all right? So this is one of those, all right? So let's see what they have to say uh, in this article, all right? Because we are talking about, you know, a lot of Egyptian resemblances here in America. And the uh, truth is that this is the source, this is their origins, and that's why there is some resemblances here to um, all the old world civilizations. You know, we have all that here, all right? It's not just like we're similar to Egyptians or we're similar to... To, you know the Hindu or all that it's everything because this is the source so from here it's spread out to the rest of the world all right so let's see what they say right here all right so I'm just gonna belly flop to this part of the article and it says after correlating all data that have been made public to the present time all right the conclusion is unavoidable that the oldest civilization was in the Yucatan and Central America all right again the kansas city journal in 1896 wrote this they're telling you that if you really do the research and you start compiling all this information all this evidence it's unavoidable all right that the oldest civilization was in the yucatan in central america future discoveries may change this conclusion it seems that egypt was first peopled by immigrants from the yucatan say what it seems that egypt was first peopled by the immigrants from Yucatan. Space will allow only a few facts that clearly indicate the truth of this assertion. First, the pyramids of Yucatan are some of them much larger than any found in Egypt. All right, much larger than any found in Egypt. That of Cheops not accepted. All right, and Giza. Second, the pyramids of Egypt bear structural evidence of having been modeled on those of Yucatan, notably of the one at Coloma, which covers 23 acres. Third, the early Egyptians and the Mayas of Yucatan had the same system of reckoning time, but the Mayas developed a system that was far superior. Again, we got that in the foreign quarterly review, right? Far superior or excelled, and which antedates that of Egypt is older than Egypt, all right? Fourth, the Mayas manufactured cement that was of the same material as that of ancient Egypt. Fifth, the architecture of Yucatan is of the same general type as that of an ancient Egypt, but it is finer and seems to have been the model that the Egyptians attempted to imitate. They attempted to imitate our models from here, America. Six, the art of both countries as displayed in their ceramics and architecture is of the same type or school that of Yucatan being much more highly developed all right again this was an article written in the Kansas City Journal Monday October 12 1896 if you want to look it up prehistoric man they're telling you straight up in this article back in 1896 that we were the source we were the cradle of civilization and we went and colonized Egypt over there just like Toph told us in Atlantis, uh, the emerald tablets, right? And the green emerald tablets, right? He told us he went over there, right? To the sons of Cam, all right? We got the Masonic book on the last video, right? What did it tell us? That this is the original Egypt. And when we're talking about prehistory, we're talking about America. That's the Masons. That's one of their most sacred books, Ancient Mystic Order, all right? Foreign Quarterly review at Mitlan there exists the remains of a palace 
which is of considerable extent. Its architecture, though distinguished by characteristics peculiarly American and different from that of any nation with which we are familiar, is to our view marked by features of stately grandeur and mel melancholy beauty. The roof of the portico is supported by plain cylindrical columns, no, no type of which we believe elsewhere exists. It doesn't exist anywhere else. The facade of the palace is covered with a beautiful mad work of basket scroll, which is, is a characteristic ornament of all the Tultecan monuments, which is often found in the sepulchral chambers of the same extraordinary people, and which Rossellini, by a singular coincidence, found in those of Egypt, among others of the magnificent scroll ornaments copies of which decorate his liberations again so they're telling you they're finding these symbols these hieroglyphs these these designs all right and uh scrolls from egypt all right again where is the duplicate it is curious that the ground plan of this palace is the egyptian tau again it is curious that the ground plan of this palace is the Egyptian Tau. All right? The Egyptian Tau. Again, the T or the cross, the Tau, the Taf. It's Aboriginal, Paleo Hebrew, one of the letters, right? The cross sticks where energies intersect, a sacred place, a monument, the emblem of the Garden of Eden. The city of gold, X marks the spot, right? All right. Finally, statues sculptured in a purely classical style, unlike the rude deformities of Mexican art, have been found in the neighborhood of Otumba, Mitlan, Chochicalco, and the magnificent flower temple of Waxaca, or Waka, right? Waka, Wakanda, sacred place. These are not the works of barbari barbarians, as Robertson intim intimates. All right, so these weren't barbarians building these. Having no metal implements to work with, this misconception is the result of the before mentioned confusion of two errors. And this confusion continues today. We got to break that. We got to really do research. Oh, wake up. Open mind. You got to prove your theories you got to really research all right it is true that the mexican semi-barbarians produce their root sculptures with stone utensils but the civilized people who preceded them worked with copper implements some of which have been discovered in their tombs all right so they're clearly telling us that there's two different kinds of people here one with science architectures you know math civilization and another one that came after that has just simple um as they say here let me see rude sculptures with stone utensils you know they didn't have a, so are those the mongols that came later on right most likely vases agree in both in shape and ornament with the earliest specimens of egyptian and Asturian pottery have been found in their sepulchral excavation. Moreover, evidences of an amount of civilization and of social comfort, which are not to be found among the popular and boosted monuments of Egypt, are furnished by the architectural memorials of this great, singular, and almost unknown people. They're talking about you, the aboriginal so-called Negro that was here. And they say that you are unknown and they say that you disappeared and they say that you came from Africa. All right. So again, this guy's just saying, you know, there's evidences of amount of civilization and social comfort, which are not to be found among the popular and boasted monuments of Egypt. It just shows basically what he's saying. You're just seeing pyramids, but you're not seeing the whole 
town, the whole city, the aqueducts, where's everything else? You can find that in Mexico. They just found 60,000 structures in the jungles of Guatemala. Well, they just released the information to us. Who knows how long ago they know about it. 60,000 structures, right? With um, This was a metropolis. It, it basically rewriting history. Millions of people lived there. Clean streets, aqueducts, highways, fortified, you know, monuments. All right? Dig into it. Roads are to be found not only in the vicinity of their great cities, but at considerable distance from them. Like I just said, all these ancient ruins are all connected by roads and highways in the middle of the jungle. That's where they're realizing today, this year, they're letting us know. And this book is from 1836, this article. Why didn't they teach us this in school? Who knows? We might have become archaeologists. We might have had an interest to dig into this stuff to our, you know, our own history, knowing that it was greater than Egypt and vast and, and magnificent and grandeur. You know, we would have probably been the archaeologists discovering and, and 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 writing about this today. All right, but we weren't given that chance. They told us everything was over there and that side over there. You want to be an archaeologist? You want to study history? You got to go over there to study in Oxford. Then you got to go to Egypt. Then you, you know, everywhere else but here. All right. Again, roads are to be found not only in the vicinity of their great cities, but at considerable distance from them. Artificially constructed like the Roman military roads of large squared blocks of stone. These roads on the same principle as the railroad affect a continued level they are in fact viaducts as contrasted with aqueducts which these people also constructed where they traverse acclivities they are parapeted and the evidences both of regular posting stations at regular intervals and of the regular division of the distances upon the principle of our milestones upon turnpike roads are still to be observed Bridges constructed of the same durable materials and traversing mountain torrents are also to be found. Where is all this in the so-called old world on the other side in Egypt? Where is all this? High science, high civilization. In these bridges, an approach to the principle of the arch and keystone may be in a few instances discerned, but generally they display the primitive and obvious form of architraves of stone, superimposed on two or more piers of the same massy character and durable materials. Every feature of these structures is at once singular, ingenious and gigantic. Ingenious and gigantic. Cyclopean in the forms of their masonry, they are characterized throughout by the same titanium character of wild and exaggerated grandeur. Take the Mississippi Valley civilization, which plays a, an important role uh, in this book. The famous sites are sites like Cahokia or Poverty Point or um, the, 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 the Ohio sites such as High Bank and Newark. Uh, amazing, you know, huge geometrical earthworks, absolutely stunning. But the trouble is that in the 18th and 19th and 20th centuries, there was massive large-scale destruction of these ancient monuments. <coughs> they were not considered to be worth preserving. The needs of agriculture and industry were more important. So what we can say is that around about 90% of the monuments that were in the Mississippi Valley in, say, 1700 are gone now. Hmm. They're not there. So archaeologists, in drawing their conclusions about that culture, are drawing it on a tiny fraction that's randomly left by chance from the mass scale wipeout that was, that was caused. And then 
when the archaeologists come to it with preconceived ideas about what sort of culture it should be, that's another form of censorship that imposes it itself upon the past. We should let the past speak for itself. The book is called Forbidding History by J. Douglas Kenyon. All right. The Central American Mystery. What could explain the failure of mainstream science to unravel the origins of Mesoamerica's advanced ancient cultures? Will Hart. The Olmec civilization surprised me the most. I had read about the Maya and knew of the Aztecs, but I was surprised for what I found in Villahermosa. Large stone heads with negroid features and stone stale carved with depictions of curious ambassadors. The figures clearly were not from any Mexican culture. These artifacts were more than just a fascinating puzzle. They represented a headache for science. They were an anomaly. Who had carved the heads? Who had created the st stele? Where did they get those models for these heads and figures? These were questions that arose because of their way scientists had reconstructed the human history of Mesoamerica. Okay, so look what he says. Africans don't fit, nor do the cloaked Caucasian figures carved on the stele. They shouldn't be there. However, they are surely there. All right, so like he says, these are questions that arise because of the way scientists have reconstructed the human history of not only Mesoamerica, but the whole world. Our whole uh, chronology, our whole history, our maps, everything has been flipped around. So people think that um, a person of copper color or so-called Negro can only come out of Africa. And also that everybody came out of Africa. That's a theory again. All right. So, you know, with that perspective, it's hard. That's why these people are, 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 you know, have questions and it's mysteries to them. But this is the true old world and the aboriginals, the so-called uh, real Americans or indigenous people of this land were so-called Negro, right? From many parts and different uh, shades of the copper color, right? Different shades, you know, all over the Americas. The, the, the so-called Amazonian cities. So yes. London around the... 16th century, 60,000 yeah. population. There, yeah. there were cities there. There were, there were enormous cities in the Amazon. This is another piece of the new evidence that's overwhelming the, the old ideas. Um, because the old idea was that there were no humans in the Amazon until about a thousand years ago. That the Amazon, although it's a luxuriant rainforest, has poor soils. And that it was impossible for human beings in large numbers to survive there. We now know they did. And the reason we know they did is tragically because of the clearances of the Amazon. So much of the Amazon has been cut down. And in those areas that have been cut down, evidence of enormous cities has emerged. Cities with populations of tens of thousands, bigger than London, uh, at, the, at, at the same time. And not only that, but evidence of high science, geometric uh, geoglyphs on, on the Earth on a scale of hundreds of meters, squares, circles. They even performed the exercise that we attribute to the ancient Greeks of squaring the circle, a very, a, a very sophisticated geometrical exercise. You can see that done on a scale of hundreds of meters in the Amazon. All right, so we're back in this journal again, the Kansas City Journal, Monday, October 12th, 1896, right? Prehistoric man, right? We're going to continue with the article. You know, it's a very long article, so I wanted you to see, like, this is the whole page actually right here. Let me just zoom out so you can see. I got the whole page right here. I forgot where I saw this. I think I saw it in uh, on a Google Plus page that they took down now because Google Plus doesn't exist anymore. And I followed up on it and I actually found the actual article. But when you go look for the article today, the archive website says they're uh, under maintenance. It should be back in a few seconds and it's been days. <laughs> so yeah, they don't want you to see this. I'm just gonna zoom into a part right here. All right, so we're gonna read from this part right here where it says they left a splendid literature. All right, so it says they left a splendid literature most of which was destroyed by the Spaniards at the time of and immediately at the time of and immediately after the conquest of 1510 to 1531 or 21. But much remains today. From what survives, we learn that these ancient people based their historical epics on astronomical phenomena. All right, so listen up, astronomical phenomena. A certain thing occurred so many days before or after a total eclipse of the sun, which was on a given day, year, and hour. Astronomers of today can calculate these eclipses and verify these historical data. 
They say that these eclipses occurred on the days and hours mentioned and that they were visible in the Yucatan. All right. So they're saying that it correlates their, their mythology when they're talking about their uh, eclipses and everything in these uh, Mayan codices. They're able to uh, date back uh, following what, you know, astronomical data that they have, you know, modern day astronomers, you know, and they calculate that these clips did happen in the time that these Mayans are saying. And it says now there is a connected written history of the country that reaches back about 9,700 years. Whoa, this is way before Egypt, Mesopotamia over there, right? Babylon, all that stuff, right? 9,700 years. Back of this are many interesting traditions and some glimpses of a splendid mythology according to one of these traditions a portion of the mayas about 40,000 years ago rebelled against the ruling king and finally withdrew to the north it says this branch seems to have passed along the gulf the coast of the gulf of mexico and to have reached louisiana so it says they went through the caribbean the gulf of mexico and got to louisiana 40,000 years ago they're saying in these codices they're finding right in these traditions astronomical traditions all right again they went through the gulf of mexico from mexico and reached louisiana and the lower mississippi valley between 30,000 and 35,000 years ago all right so what are you talking about mayas Space will allow but little in the way of proof of this last assertion. A few years ago, some cations were sunk for bridges pierced on Bayou La Forche, Louisiana. At a depth of about 62 feet, some graves were uncovered. They had been made on the sandy beach of the Gulf of Mexico and had been covered with oyster shells. The present coast is about 110 miles from the point. The average thickness of the freshwater mud so far as surveyed is not less than 40 feet from this point to the Gulf Coast. Taking the average amount of solid matter mud that has annually passed down the Mississippi River to form these deltas and Gulf Plains, and we have a measuring unit. So they're calculating, all right? See what they're telling you how they calculate it. United States government observations made daily since 1872, if I remember correctly, gives the annual amount at 57,872,000 cubic yards per year. By this unit, these graves are at least 29,000 years old. All right, you see what this paper is telling you? In 1896, all right, and the Mississippi River contributes to this. And by this unit of measurement, which they have, you know, scientists can, you know, record, these graves are at least 29,000 years old, all right? 29,000 years old. From the lower Mississippi, these people spread over much of the central portions of the North American continent, especially throughout the valleys of the Ohio and Mississippi and the lake regions. Where are they found finding all these mounds, right? It just described most of the places where most of the mounds are found in the United States. They seem to have been the original mound builders, like I just said. They seem to have been the original mound builders, and he's saying they came from the Mayas or Mexico. Many thousands of years after they left Yucatan, there was another great efflux of people from Yucatan that passed north through the center of the continent. From these last descended the so-called Toltecs, Aztecs, and their modern successors the Pueblos, Sunnis, Moquis, etc. This last wave rolled on towards the north until it met the reflux wave from the Mount Builders. Settlements further north, and then a terrible war was waged. At some future time, perhaps, I shall discuss this war and the evidences of it still in existence. I hope to be able to call attention to many of the achievements of the ancient Aztecs and their contemporaries who cons constituted the principal element in the wave of immigration last above mentioned. For many of the facts pertaining to the Mayas of Yucatan, I am indebted to Plonjon, who has lived and observed in that country most of the time since 1874. So far as many of the relics, uh, not other data are concerned, and other data is concerned, I have observed them for myself. The facts are, there are literature, 
All right, so he's saying he didn't just he didn't just sign. He's seen these relics. He's seen these records they found in the Yucatan. He's seen all the stuff that Le Plongeon is talking about. Augustus Le Plongeon. All right, so he's saying that these are, these facts are there are literature, art, and sciences that have left their evidences in North America that are more ancient. All right, more ancient and more worthy of careful study than any of that afforded by either ancient Greece or Rome. The time will come, all right? Remember, this is written in 1896, October 12th, 1896, all right? That's what, about 123 years ago? All right, now listen to what he's gonna say right here. The time will come when a classical education will include this study, my people. It's right now. This is the class. All right? You don't have to go to no college, university. All right? The time will come. The time has come when we are basically including this in our studies. That this is the true old world and you are the ancient one, the original, the so-called antediluvian. So again... You know, this was an article by Edwin Walters from the Kansas City Journal, October 12th, 1896. The Kansas City Journal, 1896. This is in page six, if you're interested to go look that up. Page six, prehistoric man, the human race and its dispersions. All right, the Maya, civilized. The Africans, Asians and Europeans. Day. But America in the 18th and, and 19th centuries was in a, an aggressively expansionist, expanding westward. Yeah. Um, and, that in, and that involved uh, taking the land of the indigenous inhabitants. Right. Well, if you're going to take away, you know, tens of millions of acres from people and stuff them somewhere else, then you need a good excuse to do so. So, so what you do is you depict them as savages and you say that actually we're doing them a favor, you know. There's a, there's a quote I, 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 I put in the, in, in, in the book concerning the horrific um, project called the boarding schools project in America where Native American children, about 90% of them, were physically removed from their families and stuck in boarding schools in another state far away, uh, punished if they wore any traditional clothing. Given the whole ideology of Western civilization and encouraged to cut themselves off from their roots. Well, no wonder we're a species with amnesia if we take the entire cultural memory banks of the indigenous inhabitants of the Americas and deliberately wipe them out. Yeah. Foreign Quarterly Review. Now, continue says, these facts being admitted or established, the question is, do the monuments of New Spain, as displayed in the illustrations of the works under review, correspond with three unvarying and un uh, identifying characteristics our reply is yes they correspond entirely some of the pyramids as we have said are larger than those of egypt some of them are different in their model having somewhat of an indian character bearing strong affinity to pyramidal temples still extant in japan and it says, see the works of Sir Thomas Raffles for that. The Pyramid of Cholula exhibits a most singular identity with the model of the temples of Belus. Okay, so again, the Pyramid of Cholula exhibits a most singular identity with the model of the temples of Belus. Belus Jupiter, Bel, Tower of Babel, described by Herodotus, and which by many scholars has been considered to be the scriptural tower of Babel. All right. It consists of the eight graduated square towers, each rising above the other and terminating in a topmost sanctuary dedicated apparently to the same solar god, but there are more singular analogies between the forms of some of the pyramids of New Spain and some of the 
most ancient pyramids of Egypt. Among the pyramids on the plain of Saqqara is one consisting of four graduated steps. The illustrations of the Antiquities Mexicanis furnish a copy of the Mexican pyramid of exactly the same form and nearly the same dimensions. So again, which one is the duplicate? They try to tell us that, you know, this is re that these these Aztec and the Mayan temples are a lot sooner that they are not as old as the, the, the Egyptian uh, pyramids but we're crushing all this illusion all this hijack chronology wise history wise right so again the illustrations of the antiquities Mexicanas and that's the book I told you this uh, nine volume book by Lord Kingsborough you know it's available online just google it um, you know says it furnishes a copy of the Mexican pyramid of exactly the same form and nearly the same dimensions as the one in Egypt and the plain of Saqqari I look it up again descending galleries at a particular astronomical angle of declination lead to central chambers either for the purpose of mystery or sepulture in the Mexican pyramids as well as the Egyptian Quite enough has been said to prove the architectural identity. It is fair to infer that tribes of the same architectural family build both. Okay, again, it is fair to infer that tribes of the same architectural family build both. In that case, they would be contemporaneous, but the evidences of the same affinity or identity multiply as we proceed. So he just said, that means they would be living or uh, of the same time at least. Okay, so he didn't say Egypt is older. He's saying this, this is basically concluding that they were at least around the same time because they have the same kind of technology, uh, structures, architecture, uh, you know, language, the hieroglyphic system, everything. All right, so, but we know this is older over here. All right, so, because remember, his hijack, from what he thinks is the is the truth is that the old world's on that side so his perspective and orientation is different than ours all right okay and quite apart from the lies you you've exposed i wouldn't want to call them lies i don't think that the archaeologists have deliberately lied i want to be clear about that i think honestly speaking that the majority of archaeologists who held to that old model that has now been completely discredited honestly believed what they were saying to be true. They felt that that's what the evidence said. And then their careers became connected to that idea and they became very reluctant to accept any idea that threatened that. And I think it's more that natural territoriality of human beings rather than a deliberate attempt to hide the truth of the past from us. But the effect has been as overwhelming or worse than a deliberate attempt to cover up the past because a hundred thousand years of the human story has just been completely shut down until now all right so now we're in this book all right it's called queen mu we're gonna know who queen mu is all right and the egyptian Sphinx by augustus le plongeon md all right so this is augustus right here all right, so Augustus Le Plogen spent a lot of time uh, studying uh, the Egyptians and the Mayas. Uh, I believe before he, um, you know, got into the whole Maya thing, he was studying a lot of the Egyptians, and he must he noticed a lot of things very similar to the Mayas, and that's what got him to go over to the Yucatan. So this is one of his books. Let me just show you uh, other books he has, just so you can get a reference of this person. So he has this book. It's called The Mayas. The sources of their history. I just skimmed through it. I haven't really read it too much, but basically, he's listing out all the people, all the sources, all the scholars, all the explorers who, who's basically written anything about the Mayas. All right. So he's quoting them, so you can see who's talks about them, and then he has his little accounts, as it says here, uh, by Dr. Leplin John Yucatan, his account of discoveries. And this is written in 1877. All right. So this is another book he has. It says here, Sacred Mysteries Among the Mayas and the Quiches 11,500 years ago. Their relation to the sacred mysteries of Egypt, Greece, Chaldea, and India. Freemasonry in times anterior to the Temple of Solomon. 
illustrated by Augustus Lepple Jones. So now I just want to uh, right here says he's the author also of a sketch of the ancient inhabitants of Peru and their civilization, vestiges of the Mayas, essay on vestiges of antiquity, essay on the causes of earthquake religion of Jesus compared with the teachings of the church, the monuments of Mayaks and their historical teachings. All right, so this book right here is 1886. A lot of drop in here. We're going to definitely get into this book. All right. All right, so this is another book of his. It's called Vestiges of the Mayas or facts tending to prove that the communication and intimate relations must have existed in very remote times between the inhabitants of Mayab and those of Asia and Africa by Augustus Le Plougeon, member of the American Antiquarian Society of Worcester, Mass., of the California Academy of Sciences, and several other scientific societies, author of various essays in scientific works. All right, so is this guy, can we consider him a scholar? Well, you're going to see all the research he did. All right. This is not pseudo. All right. All right. So remember, I just wanted you to get a little background of him because we are going to go into some deep stuff in this book. And basically, he's going to correlate everything we've been learning. Well, everything I've been learning personally uh, in this journey I've had since I started my channel. Um, and, and, you know, it's amazing to find books like this. It's amazing to know that there was actually explorers, whatever their background, Freemasons, they were evil or not, or if they were racist, whatever. But what they found here cannot be disputed. What they wrote down here, the proof and correlation can't be disputed. All right. This is the stuff that they never put in your textbooks. They don't want you thinking like this. Again, remember the last video, Manifest Destiny. Anything prior to Columbus was considered savage. All right, they weren't going to consider it for historical purposes. All right, manifest destiny. All right, so let's get into this book. And so let's begin. We're here in the preface. In this work, I offer no theory. All right, this ain't no theories here. In questions of history, theories prove nothing. All right, they are therefore out of place. I leave my readers to draw their own inferences from the facts presented for their consideration. All right, so just look over the info. Whatever be their conclusions is no concern of mine. One thing, however, is certain. Neither their opinion nor mine will alter events that have happened in the dim past, of which so little is known today. All right, so anything that I say or you say will not change anything. If you agree or disagree with any of this, it still doesn't change the truth. All right, a record of many of these events has reached our times written by those who took part in them, in a language still spoken by several thousands of human beings. There we may read part of man's history and follow the progress of his civilization. The study in situ of the relics of the ancient Mayas has revealed such striking analogies between their language, their religious conceptions, their cosmogonic notions, their manners and customs, their traditions, their architecture, and the language, the religious conceptions, the cosmogonic notions, the manners and customs, the traditions, the architecture of the ancient civilized nations of Asia, Africa, and Europe, of which we have any knowledge. That is, has become evident to my mind, at least that such similarities are not merely effects of hazard but the result of intimate communications that must have existed between all of them. And that distance was no greater obstacle to their intercourse than it is today to that of the inhabitants of the various countries. All right. All right. So he's saying, just like we're reading in the foreign quarterly review, what they found in Palenque, they found a lot of similarities with uh, all these, uh, you know, nations and, and places in the world, these continents, all these uh, people living in those continents, the, the so-called old world, right? He's saying the same thing. Augustus, right? He's saying the same thing. It's evident. There was intimate communications, all right? They're related somehow. But it's basically what he's telling you. It has been and still is a favorite hypothesis which certain students of ethnology that the Western continent, now known as America or Amaraca, Amarucan received its human population, therefore its civilization from Asia. All right. So remember, this is written in the 1800s. We already know 
our uh, archaeologists, his scientists, historians, like Graham Hancock said, are admitting they had it wrong. The Clovis thing, they had it wrong. All right, they found human habitation over 130,000 years ago. All right, at least. So that whole Asia out of Asia, Bering Strait, that's false. And he already knew this at this time in the 1800s. True, there is a split in their ranks. They are not quite certain if the immigration in America came from Tartary across the Strait of Bering or from Hindostan over the waste of the Pacific Ocean. This, however, is of little consequence. There are those who pretend, like Klaproth, that the cradle of humanity is to be found on the plateau of Pamir, between the high peaks of the Himalayan ranges, or like Messrs, Renan and Barthelemy St. Hilary, who place it in the region of the Tamils, in the countries where the Bible says the Garden of Eden was situated. While others are equally certain men came from Lemuria, that submerged continent invented by P.L. Sclatter, which Heckel believes was the birthplace of the primitive ape man, and which they say now lies under the waves of the Indian Ocean. The truth of the matter is that these opinions are mere conjectures, simple hypotheses, and their advocates know no more when and where the man first appeared on earth than the newborn baby knows of his surroundings or how he came. The learned wranglers on this shadowy and dim point forget that all leading geologists now agree in the opinion that America is the oldest known continent on the face of the planet. All right? Boom! That came out of nowhere, right? right? But we've already read and heard who? Louis Agassiz, the most renowned geologist, tell us that America is the first land, is the true old world. All right? And what is Augustus telling us? Right? That all the leading geologists now agree, not just one, all the leading geologists now agree in the opinion that America is the oldest known continent on the face of the planet. That the fossil remains of human beings found in various parts of it, far distant from each other, prove that man lived there in times immemorial, and that we have, have, and that we have not the slightest ray of light to illumine the darkness that surrounds the origin of those primeval men. All right, we got in the past videos, right? How they're finding human bones in these deep layers, right? They're supposed to be millions of years old, right? All right, so at this time, all geologists knew this was the real oldest continent, the oldest known continent on the face of the planet, plain. Furthermore, it is now admitted by the generality of scientists that man, far from descending from a single pair located in a particular portion of Earth's surface, has appeared on every part of it where the biological conditions have been propitious to his development and maintenance. All right, he's telling you not just in Africa. No out of Africa theories here. Again, he told you in the beginning of this book, this ain't about theory. And that the production of the various species with their distinct, well-marked anatomical and intellectual characteristics was due to the difference of those biological conditions and to the general forces calling forth animal life prevalent in the places where each particular species has appeared and whose distinctive marks were adapted to its peculiar environment. All right, we've been talking about this in these lives we go on and in the back chats, you know, how could, you know, the animal kingdom and the plant kingdom have diverse, you know, different family species all over the world. They're not all the same. So it'll be the same for humans. Like he's saying, this is what he's trying to tell you is the same, all right? Humans did not just come out of one place, all right? The Maya sages doubtless has reached similar conclusions since they call their country Mayak. That is the land first emerged from the bottom of the deep, all right? The Maya, they knew this was the oldest land, Mayak. Right? We got Agassiz, right? Louis Agassiz, who told us this is the first land out of the primordial waters. All right? Now, the Maya, they call their country Mayak. That is the land first emerged from the bottom of the deep. 
And we read in Genesis, right? Let there be land. Let the water subside. Let the land show. And there was land. The first land, America. The country of the Shu. And the Egyptians, according to Herodotus, boosted that their ancestors in the lands of the West, all right, were the oldest men on earth. All right, quote Herodotus, go research that. He's telling you that the Egyptians, their ancestors in the lands of the West. So if you're in Africa, America's to the West, were the oldest men on earth. If the opinion of Leo Humphrey and a host of modern geologists regarding the priority of America's antiquity be correct, all right, so I didn't even know about this guy, Leo Humphrey study him all right a known geologist in that time be correct what right have we to gainsay the assertion of the mayas and of the egyptians in claiming likewise priority for their people and their country all right so the mayas are telling you they are from the oldest land all right and the egyptians are telling you that their ancestors come from the west which is the oldest man on earth which will be the oldest land, right? And so what are the, some of the things that we're gonna learn from reading this book? What are some of the new insights about both North and South America yeah. that we might've just previously assumed what I, I did? There's not much happening there, not much we can learn. Yes. Well, there's a, there's a whole range of things, actually. The, the, first, the first and most important issue to understand, and I've really done a great deal of work on this, is that North America was at the epicenter of a humongous global cataclysm. So, so one, part of, one part of it is the, uh, and I've tried to really bring this home, uh, how central America was to, to this cataclysmic event that took place across the whole world. And then consider what did that, what did that obliterate? What did that event obliterate? What did it wipe out from the, from the human story? Is this a lost civilization? You've I, always talked about this. You see, when you're, when you're looking for a lost civilization, and, and, and I mean a civilization, something that we would recognize as a civilization, I, 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 I'll, I'll tell you directly, I don't think they flew to the moon, and I don't think they had airplanes. But I think that we're talking about a civilization more than 12,000 years ago, which was as advanced as our civilization was, say, in the late 18th century or early 19th century. In other words, they could navigate the world. They could explore the world. They could measure the Earth accurately. They had precise astronomy. Um, they could create beautiful maps that were accurate in terms of latitude and longitude. That kind of, that kind of level of civilization. Okay. I think, I think that's, what was, that's what was sitting there. Now, you need a place where such a civilization can evolve, and you need to explain why archaeology hasn't found it yet. And I've considered many possibilities over the years. Back in 1995 with Fingerprints of the Gods, Antarctica looked very interesting to me. Uh, later I became very interested in what's called the Sunda Shelf, which is the area of land around what's now the Malaysian Peninsula and the Indonesian Islands out to the Philippines. That was a continent-sized landmass that was above water during the Ice Age and is underwater now. Very interesting to look there and see what's, see what's going on there. But the one place that nobody ever looked, precisely because of the ideology, precisely because of what we've been taught about the Americas, was the Americas. Nobody looked there. It was not considered worth looking there. And I, I think that's a huge mistake because it, the Americas stand out as a candidate with this amazing richness of resources. And then the second thing, because of the character of the Ice Age, there were long periods when the Americas were cut off from the rest of the world cut off from the conflicts and the difficulties going on in the so-called old world. What a beautiful and amazing place for a civilization to evolve, a civilization that was separate, that was different, that had its own way of doing things. Uh, that, is, that is one of the reasons why I think we need to take America very, very seriously, because we now know that the archaeological story we've been taught about the Americas is complete and utter bullshit. Complete and utter bullshit. Complete and utter bullshit. From beginning to end, Clovis was not first. Clovis was a latecomer to the Americas. 
Uh, we know that archaeology has not had its eye on the ball because of Clovis. They've not been considering the pre-Clovis ages. It's only now that they're beginning to look at what happened before Clovis. So they've just closed their eyes uh, to, to all of those possibilities. And then, of course, on top of that, you have the massive destruction of, that, that took place um, in the Mississippi Valley and across the Americas of Native American culture and of Native American memories. All right, so we're back in the book Queen Mu and the Egyptian Sphinx by Augustus Le Plongeon. All right, 1896. It is to the monumental inscriptions and to the books of the Mayas that we must turn if we wish to learn about the primeval traditions of mankind, all right, the Mayas, the development of civilization and the events that took place centuries before the dim myths recorded as occurrences at the beginning of our written history. Historians, when writing on the universal history of the race, have never taken into consideration that of man in America, okay? Like Graham Hancock told you, there was a doctrine, a dogma, and historians, when they were talking about the universal history of the race, of the human race, they never took into consideration that of man in America and the role that in remote ages American nations played on this world stage. The importance, what we did, what we provided. Have you not read the American Indian contributions to the world encyclopedia? Have you not read that? How important and what influence we had and what we, you know, the role we played in the world stage again and the influence they exerted over the populations of Asia Africa and Europe all right Amaru Khans Amaru priest kings priest kings the Amaru priest kings the role they played on the world stage and the influence they exerted over the populations of Asia Africa and Europe still as far as we can scan the long vista of the past centuries, the Mayas seem to have had direct and intimate communications with them. This fact is indeed no new revelation as proved by the universality of the name Maya, which seems to have been as well known by all civilized nations thousands of years ago as is today that of the English. Thus, we meet with it in Japan, the islands of the Pacific Hindustan, now remember Hindustan, that's the real name of India, okay, Asia Minor, Egypt, Greece, Equatorial Africa, North and South America, as well as in the countries known to us as Central America, which in those times composed the Maya Empire, all right, all of Central America. The seat of the government and residence of the rulers was the peninsula of the Yucatan, all right, so that was like the capital, the epicenter, the Yucatan, but they ruled the whole Central America. Wherever found the name Maya is synonymous with power, wisdom, and learning, all right? Wherever you're gonna hear or see this word, Maya, it is synonymous with power, wisdom, and learning. <laughs> 